Let us now carry out the induction. So an inductive proof has a very simple structure. It contains basically uh, two elements. And in order to visualize what we need to do, I didn't yet clean the blackboard. So the first step is the base step, which means we prove everything for L equals zero before we do any sub-integration. So L equals zero is allowed here in the statement, and this will be our base step. And then second, we need to do the induction step from L minus one to L. And this again consists of very precisely writing down our induction hypothesis, which is the same statement, but for L minus one, and then carrying out the integral from L minus one to L. And we will need to prove at every stage all of what you see here. So the functional form in, and uh, all these properties of the functional form that we wrote down here. The variables, um, the measure, the functions which appear, and we will also need to establish that proposition D in this way holds at the next level so that we can carry out the next step in the proof. This is what we need to do. And so let me now clean the blackboard. Let me clean the lower part so that we keep an eye on what we want to establish at the end. Right, so first we need to do our base step. Which means we set L equals zero and we prove that everything we said before is true. So L equals zero means that in our chain of treated subgraphs, no graph at all is treated. We are just at the level of the full graph G. And then for our full graph G, we need to prove that this is uh, the way we can write our integral for the full graph G. And then no integral integrals have been carried out, so this is just a full expression. So essentially, Everything is clear because uh, we have done our proposition C, which is uh, the precise statement of how we can write the graph in an integral form be with, before treating any renormalization. And it was essentially this form. Of course, by the way, if we have no treated graphs, then there are no uh, M's here, no maximal treated graphs, and there is no such term. Therefore, uh, in the expression, there is only this C infinity function of all the physics variables with tildes and the integration measure. So that's all. We need to show that uh, the integral has the form loop factors times integrals over uh, t's and eta's with an integration measure factor, numerator factors, and the C infinity function, which is analytic in epsilon. And that's exactly what we did in our proposition C. On the other hand, uh, we needed to establish that also proposition D holds, and uh, proposition D for before treating any graph is literally uh, our lemma from uh, some lectures ago, and also the original statement without counterterms of this proposition D. So of course, uh, for before treating any graph, that proposition D is uh, absolutely valid. So proposition C and D show essentially that our statement is true up to one detail. So let's say almost everything is clear. With one exception. And the single exception is our integration measure. The integration measure is now written in a different way. It contains this omega h bar, while previously we had here the omega h without bar. And uh, now we have instead the xi. Previously we didn't have the xi. So we just need to show that our previous way and the current way to write the measure are the same. They are, of course, um, and that is the only thing uh, we need to prove. And, uh, I made explicit the appearance of mu or mu tilde now by doing this definition here, but uh, that is clear. So uh, we factored out of the loop factor CD for each uh, T. There are as many T's as there are loops. 
a factor of mu tilde to the two epsilon, and then this uh, appearance is already uh, fully clear. But let us discuss the other thing uh, with the t variables. So the only detail that we need to look at is the integration measure. And uh, I would say that the original measure can be put into the following form. We have a product over all the t variables, all the subgraphs in our forest, i. And then we had dti over ti times ti to the power omega hi without bar plus 2 epsilon times the number of loops in the respective subgraph. We didn't exactly write it in this way, but it's uh, obvious that we can bring it into this form with a minus, of course. Uh, the previous time we still wrote explicitly the number of loops and the number of lines and the numerator degree, but that can obviously be combined to uh, exactly this expression. So that is our original formulation. Uh, and of course, uh, the, you might say, why should we change the measure? The measure is correct, and um, so we could just write down our induction hypothesis using this kind of measure. And we could, for sure. Actually, I tried to do it uh, this way without introducing the abbreviation omega h bar because that is just yet another notation that we need. But uh, introducing the measure in this way is really an ingenious trick for the following reason. What is the difficulty with this uh, way to write the measure? The difficulty comes into play if we have counter terms. If we have counter terms, then imagine you want to combine a graph G and counter term graphs where you might uh, have some counter term graph one. So one sub diagram H counter term one is reduced to a point and replaced by a counter term or some other counter term two subgraph is replaced by a counter term insertion. Then you need to compare all these different graphs and of course bring it to a unified form and uh, cancel divergences and uh, write it in a form like this after summing the details. And now what happens to the integration measure if you compare the graphs? So this is the integration measure of uh, the big graph. Then for uh, that graph here, you would have an analogous measure, but not the same. Uh, namely, here in this um, uh, number of loops, you would have um, not the number of loops uh, of the original subgraph i, but you would have the number of loops of the subgraph i after you have shrunk the counter term graph one to a point. And then this might reduce the number of loops if that is a subgraph of your graph i, but if this is a graph outside, then it doesn't reduce the number of loops here. So um, you get a, let's say, non-uniform um, expression for the number of loops after you add this counter term graph. Then you add a second counter term graph, and then uh, this might again change or not change the number of loops of any given subgraph hi. And so this is the difficulty. So you cannot uniformly combine the measure for all the different counter term graphs. And the new way to write the measure does that exactly. And so then you can really nicely combine graphs and counter term graphs and factor out a common measure factor. And you can combine the rest and cancel divergences. So this is the difficulty. So let us now prove the equality. So in order to write a different Li versus L, here you would have Hi over H counter term one and so on. Now compare or compute the following. We can uh, use this definition of the omega and write omega h i is equal to omega h i bar plus 
the sum over all maximal subgraphs of Hi uh, times all the omegas for the maximal subgraphs. Now, as I already said before, and uh, now let me say it in more detail. So now you can recursively apply the same definition for the subgraphs. So now this maximal subgraph omega is again expressed in terms of omega m bar plus the omegas for its maximal subgraphs. And then you go on iteratively. So each time you get um, only omega uh, for barred graphs until you reach graphs which have no subgraphs anymore. And then uh, the bar and the non-barred omega is the same. That means you can write down uh, your omega original in terms of sums of only h bars. And what you pick up is always the omegas for the maximal subgraphs, then the maximal subgraphs of the subgraphs, then further subgraphs, and so on. So you pick up just exactly all graphs which are somehow subgraphs of the original hi. Therefore, you can simply write it like this. Hj is a subgraph or equal to the graph Hi, and you just sum up all these omega Hj bars. That's just all. So you can completely express your omega uh, for one graph by the omega H bars for all its subgraphs. And actually, you can do the same for the loop number, because for the loop number, it's actually even easier. For the loop number, you can say um, you have this maximal subgraphs in your graph. Then they are maximal and our forest uh, that builds our sector is maximal. That means uh, there, for each number of loops, there is precisely one element in our forest. Therefore, the maximal subgraphs have exactly combined as many loops as this minus one. Therefore, the relationship is always that the loop number of this graph is one higher than the sum of all the loop numbers of its maximal subgraphs. Right, and as an example, let's look again at our famous example here. So this block here is our subgraph H5. Its maximal subgraphs are this two-loop graph, which contains the one-loop graph. So this is a two-loop subgraph, and this is a one-loop subgraph. So this has two maximal subgraphs, and the loop number of the two maximal subgraphs are two plus one is three. And this graph overall has four loops. So you have exactly this relationship. And again, also here you can go on. So then the loop number of the subgraphs is expressed in terms of one plus their maximal subgraphs and so on. And uh, doing this recursively gives you simply a sum over absolutely all subgraphs, hj subgraph or equal to our original h1. And then you just sum over one. Very simple. Which also simply tells us that uh, this subgraph here uh, this graph Hi has as many subgraphs as it has loops. The loop number is equal to the number of subgraphs. Therefore, this is an equality. Now, using these two equalities, we can prove the equality of the measure directly. So the measure is now pi i, product of all the dTi's over Ti, and then we can write the next as uh, another product of j, where j, uh, abbreviated notation, is a subgraph uh, or equal to the graph i. And then we multiply ti to the sum of those powers. So here the omega is now written as a sum over all the omegas with bars. So omega uh, j bar. So this would be a sum in the exponent sum of all the subgraphs with omega bars, and then plus two epsilon times one. So and then this product over all the j's picks up as many two epsilons as there are loops that reproduces precisely that. So we just bring these terms into the exponent. This is now our measure. 
And uh, now we can use a clever trick, and actually maybe I can simplify it by doing it at the blackboard. So what can we do? It's difficult to do it on paper, but on the blackboard we can very nicely do it. We now have here a product, uh, just over all pairs of graphs where one is bigger than the other one. And here we have some factor that we multiply over. So what we can do is just to flip the indices, and then we have basically uh, our expression that we want. Let us flip the indices, it's just a uh, renaming. I becomes J and J becomes I. I becomes J and J becomes I. Then we have this. And uh, so now we have a, a still a product over pairs of graphs. Uh, one is bigger than the other one. And then you see, um, that actually you can also see that the exponent is now equal. So you have some uh, product of uh, p's to some exponent. If you imagine i is fixed for a moment and uh, j runs in the product, then you can bracket it also like this. Let's bracket it like this. Then uh, i is multiplied over from here and then here we multiply over any j for a fixed i product over all the tj's with the exponent which depends on i. And now this product here is by definition nothing but ti times psi i where psi i or all the other t's, the other t's of subgraphs which are bigger than our graph i. And that is what we claim. So this is our claim. So actually we have now completely rewritten our measure into this form and that proves that our um, induction statement is correct for L equal zero. And of course, just to say it explicitly, all the many, many comments which were written on this blackboard are true. First of all, there are no such maximal subgraphs and therefore this factor doesn't exist. Second, this function here, our G, uh, with capital G and uh, the correct statement would now be empty set here because we have not not subtracted anything. So here we have the empty set. Then this is now directly given as uh, our semantic polynomial and our e to the i w g. This is our expression that we have now. And that is a C infinity expression in all the physics variables and it is analytic in epsilon as we have claimed. And we have proven before that it depends on all the tilde variables which are rescaled using all the existing t's. And everything else is clear. And uh, the last uh, item here on our comment list was this proposition d and that definitely holds as long as we have not uh, done any counter term subtraction. Therefore we have completed our base step and now let us go to the next step, which is the induction step from L minus one to L, where we can now assume uh, that L is arbitrarily large. And we have already done a few of those subtractions and we want to do the next one. And the first step in uh, doing this induction step is actually to write down very clearly our induction hypothesis once again, but specialized to the case L minus one. And then we use only that and nothing else as uh, in, in our step from L minus one to L. So let me clean the blackboard once again, only the lower one, so that we have an eye on what we uh, need to put as an induction hypothesis at the level L minus one. So let's write very clearly what we assume. And we can pick as an example again our six loop graph. And in order to be concrete, let us now assume, let's say L is bigger than zero. And we assume that uh, our induction hypothesis holds for L minus one. 
and then we want to go to the next step. And uh, so that means here, let us assume we have done everything up to H4, and the next step would be H5. So let's denote what we have done. We have treated this graph here, then next we have treated that one loop graph, next we have treated the two loop graph, and then we have treated this third one loop graph. And the next step would be H5, which is this for loop block. Now, let us write down what we have in general. So we have a set of treated graphs. This is a set which I call X prime, which is the same as the set X, but without our graph H. And in our example, it would be the set H1, H2, H3, H4, up to H4. Then we have a set of treated maximal graphs, which is H0 uh, prime. And this set of treated maximal graphs can be split into two subsets, which I give explicit names, namely M1 up to M small s, joined with capital M1 up to capital M capital S, capital S small s. Okay? And these are the maximal subgraphs of our next graph H, and these are disjoint from H. These are disjoint from H. So now if, if we go to the next step, then uh, our next sub uh, maximal graphs are the same ones as this plus H. And all of these maximal subgraphs are replaced by one single graph capital H. But they are unaffected because they are disjoint. So we have this jump in our set of maximal treated graphs. So in the example, what are our tr maximal treated graphs? So the set X0 prime would be, this is a maximal graph, H1. Then this is a maximal treated graph, H4. And uh, this two loop graph here, which was called H3. This is also a maximal treated graph. But this graph here, this is treated, but it's not a maximal treated graph. So this does not appear in our set X0 prime. Then uh, what are the subgraphs and what are disjoint graphs? So this graph is disjoint, and these two are subgraphs of our next graph. Therefore, uh, the next set X0, after treating the next graph, would look different. It would be H1 and H5. So in our notation here, this small m is H4, H3, and capital M is H1. Okay. So this is uh, the structure of what has been done before. So in the next graph to be treated is H. And now let us write down our statement. And I will write down the statement in a form which makes it optimal for understanding what we need to prove. So our statement is the formula over there, but specifically written for the set X prime, where we know that uh, it has the same missing graphs as those, plus additionally H is missing. And so we can treat uh, the integral in a way which highlights the special role of H as the next graph which is going to be treated. So this is a sum of terms like the following. We have our loop factors, CD to the power L, G minus L. Um, and uh, we have one less not treated graph, so let me write it into two different lines. So, okay, so it's a product. First line, second line, third line, they are all multiplied. And uh, so this is uh, one more loop factor as before, but split into different lines. And then the integral products I also write as a product. So here we have all the integrals for all the graphs outside of our set X. And then here I have additionally 
the th integral. So really, I, according to this, I could have written i not equal x prime, but I split this into i not equal x, and then the h is treated separately. But it's really the same thing. Then we have our integration measures, dti over ti times mu tilde to the 2 epsilon for each of these i's, and here we then have dti uh, h over th times mu to the 2 epsilon. And then we have those measure factors that we have just understood, ti times xi i to the power minus omega h i plus 2 epsilon, and here as well, th xi h to the power minus omega h bar plus 2 epsilon. And uh, then we have here the numerator factors, set h i for every i outside of x, and here we have set tilde h specific to our next subgraph h. Then we have the beta integrals, beta k, where these are now all the lines outside of x in quotation marks, and these are the betas in our special next treated subgraph. So these are the new lines which uh, we need to treat when we take into account the next subgraph. This is, these are precisely the lines in h bar. And these are the lines, uh, uh, not element, any graph in x. Then we have here all the factors for uh, this, so maximal uh, capital M, not element x zero, and here then uh, product over all the small m's, small m's, which are, uh, okay, let me write it like this. This product specifically refers to all these capital M's, and this product specifically refers to the small m's, and I denote it by m sub i, and i runs from 1 to capital S, and here m sub i, where i runs from 1 to small s. So these are the maximal subgraphs outside h, and these are the maximal subgraphs inside h. And uh, this covers all of these, and for each of them I need to write this factor, xi mi to the power minus omega mi times f tilde mi times mu tilde xi mi comma epsilon. And here, xi small mi to the power minus omega mi, and then f tilde small mi with argument mu tilde xi mi comma epsilon. Now, what I just did was to distribute all of these factors onto two lines, and now comes the last factor, which is g, small g. And this is just here at the very end, small g, sub big g, comma, x prime. This is now the function that we obtained after treating the graphs in x prime without h. Then u tilde equals zero. That is the full form of our statement, but written in a way which highlights the role of the next graph H. Okay. So basically, uh, here we had two lines, products of measure, uh, measure factors, uh, then the f tilde terms, and then the g term. Here we have again the measure for h separated and for the rest, then uh, here the betas for the rest and for h, then the measure factors for the rest and for h, product of the maximal subgraphs split into two groups, maximal subgraphs outside h, maximal subgraphs inside h, and then g. So the structure is the same. But now you see that, of course, the second line is the line which only contains integrals specific to our next subgraph h. And this is exactly the integrals that we want to evaluate and we want to combine with the counter term graphs at the next level. While the first line contains only stuff 
which will be treated later. Therefore, in the course of our following calculation, the first line and this uh, sum of terms like that will never be touched and never be changed, we will only deal with the last line. And because of this ingenious rewriting of the measure, our counterterm graphs will have the same measure here for the second line. Therefore, uh, we know already we can factor out the second line also out of our counterterm diagrams. And uh, the only difference uh, when we add counterterm diagrams to the full diagram uh, comes from differences in this third line. So let us highlight this third line as a star. This is the quantity that we need to treat. Now I just write down also the variables. So first of all, it is clear that all comments apply. In particular, the variables R, Q tilde, M tilde, U tilde, with the appropriate sets. So as I said, there are not all the U's exist anymore. Some U's have been uh, put away. But there are all Q's and all M's, but they are rescaled. And they are rescaled with all the TI's from here and with our TH from here. So and when I say TI, then I always mean uh, I is a subgraph which is not in the set of treated graphs. And, uh, and TH is, of course, the variable for the dext graph. Then uh, the variables are also beta, but I don't write this down explicitly. But let me write down this uh, no explicit tg in our function g sub g comma x prime. That is necessary and useful. Okay, so only the uh, third line denoted by star is now of interest. And um, it also, um, this is the thing which will be changed in the counterterm diagrams, and that is what we need to care about. So I think let me uh, now write down a few notes um, before we go on. Mm. Okay, actually uh, not. I think let us just make some space and then start seriously to do the induction. We will have to start with a few basic remarks and then we uh, will go on. So as I said, let us uh, start with making some very simple basic comments and we can uh, look at the example to understand what I mean. So let us first uh, notice that in our formula, which we will need to deal with, there appear these maximal subgraphs of our next graph H. Okay, so let us say, here, this is our next graph H in the example, which was H5. Then it has maximal subgraphs, and the maximal subgraphs are this two-loop graph here on the left and the one-loop graph on the right. Now, what appears here are the xi. So therefore, let me ask, what is actually the value of this xi3? This xi3 is the uh, product of all the other t's um, for the subgraph H3. This is the subgraph H3. So what are the other T's that we need to multiply uh, um, T3 with when we want to scale the alphas in that subgraph? So we need to scale the alphas in that subgraph with all T's for all graphs which are bigger than this. Therefore, we need to scale the alphas here with T3 itself, then with T5, because that is part of H5, and with T6, because it's also part of T6, and therefore the other T's are T5 times T6. What is the Xi for the other maximal subgraph here? Again, uh, the other T's are all the other T's uh, for the subgraphs which this is part of. It is again part of H5, and it is part of H6. So you see, and this is of course uh, logical and general, that all the size of all these maximal subgraphs, they are all equal. 
and they are simply given by the next t for our treated graph, t5, and then all the other t's corresponding to our next graph. So that could always be written as t5 times xi5, because whatever comes after t5 is only determined by what uh, next graphs h5 lies within. Therefore, all these maximal xi's here appearing here, xi small m, they are all equal, and they are all equal to the product of the next t times the other t's corresponding to that one. That is the first remark. Let me write down this remark here. For all mi, the xi mi is always equal to th times xi h. So they are all equal and can be replaced by this th specific quantity. Therefore, we have here a product over uh, all these different maximal subgraphs. Remember, they are all disjoint. So H3, H4, they are disjoint. But the xi's here are the same. So the xi's appear here. This is a universal prefactor appearing for all of them. And uh, also here, um, this uh, argument is always the same. It's always the same argument for all these different ifs. That is good to know. So actually what we have here is uh, at many places this combination appears. So the combination appears here, the combination appears here, and already the combination has appeared there. So we might almost say everywhere this particular combination appears in the integral. It's not completely right. You can think where uh, does this appear individually. But at all these places it's this combination which appears. Another question, another question is about all subgraphs. We have now uh, looked at the maximum subgraphs of H5. Now let's look at all subgraphs. All subgraphs are H4, H3, and H2, the one loop subgraph. Because for each of them, we need to look at rescaled variables. So here in our treatment, for example, here in this final function, the C infinity function, which depends on the physics, this contains the rescaled variables. So it contains in particular Q tilde H2, Q tilde H3, Q tilde H5. And it also contains Q tilde H4, H1, H6, and so on. It contains everything, but in particular, it contains all of those. And uh, these are all the Qs corresponding to any place in this big next graph that we want to treat. So QH2 corresponds to those momenta here. QH3 corresponds to those momenta. Q, um, okay, so let's also include QH4. QH4 corresponds to these momenta. And QH5 would be the additional momenta, which are only in H5. What are the rescalings for all of them? So, okay, they are always proportional to the, let's just write the rescalings. What are the t's which appear in the rescaling? So remember the rescaling is only done with the remaining t variables. So originally this was rescaled with t2, t3, t5, and t6. Now uh, t2 is gone, t3 is gone, so it's only rescaled with t5 times t6. That was originally rescaled with t3, t5, t6. Now t3 is gone, so it's only rescaled with t5, t6. That h5 was always rescaled with t5, t6. Is that changed? No, it's not changed because uh, that has not been uh, dealt with. So it's still an integration variable. Then H4 was originally scaled with this. Now T4 has been dealt with. T4 doesn't exist anymore. Therefore, the rescaling is only done with this. Now what do you see? All the rescalings are now equal. In general, if you take any subgraph of the next graph H, 
then all the previous t's are gone. Therefore, all the rescalings for everything inside of the next graph is only done in an equal fashion by uh, this combination. So, the next remark, therefore, is for all subgraphs, H prime subgraph of H in our sector, of course, um, we have Q H uh, tilde prime for this particular subgraph has the same rescaling as our next graph, and that rescaling is it is given by th times psi h. This holds for h itself, and it also holds for all its subgraphs. That means, again, all these momentum variables which are inside of our subgraph h, no matter how deeply inside of it, h2, h3, and so on, no matter how deeply inside of it, they have now all the same rescaling. And therefore, again, also here, this same combination appears as there. What is the only uh, separate dependence on TH? So in the first line, there is none. In the second line, here, of course, in the measure, you could even put in a factor of psi h. Then also here you have uh, the product appearing. Here it's the product. Here it's the same product. Here it's the same product. And here, the momenta also depend on the same product. So where is an individual dependence? It is only in those, uh, let me call it, t times bhg, like terms, which we discussed also in general. That was part of our proposition C. In our proposition C, we had disentangled this generalized M tilde, curly M tilde matrix, which contains off-diagonal blocks. And in those off-diagonal blocks, individual ratios of T's appear. And that means that also there, not this complete product appears, but a certain only some subset of factors can appear in this off-diagonal block of the curly M tilde. That's the only place where uh, the T's can still enter individually. Therefore, we cannot just do an integral substitution and uh, globally substitute this product and simplify our integral because the individual factors do appear, but they do appear only in a very special way. So this is the first remark. Now, let us go on 